Thanks. Our next speaker is Jim Tung. He is a 30 year veteran and fellow at MathWorks. And I can see your video and I hope the screen sharing works as well, Jim. All right, you can, oh, I don't hear you. you I'm on mute, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, perfect, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. And actually, uh, greetings to everybody. It's my first time at OSLC Fest, so it'd be interesting to see what conversations ensue. Um, and actually, the, the questions on the last uh, on the last session um, with Robert were interesting because I think uh, that that question of whether links within system and cross systems are appropriate, I think, will factor into my my talk. Um, let me start by saying that um, I guess I come in as a bit of an outsider, even though MathWorks obviously is a provider of tools and functionality, and we do have some OSLC support. Um, I, I guess I'll I'll present this as a bit of an ask to the OSLC community um, in terms of what we see happening in the market, what our customers need, um, and and what we're what, what, what's the scope of our work is uh, in general. Uh, realizing also that the people in the audience is gonna be a mix of, of maybe our, our customers, our end users, as well as other tool vendors who may be partners of ours and also potentially overlap as well. So I'll try and keep it um, at the appropriate level. Um, so, um, okay, let me get started. So um, a little bit of my background. Um, I, I've been in MathWorks for but a little over 34 years. And as a MathWorks fellow, I help us to define our technology and business roadmaps across the company. And I'm also um, an executive liaison for key customers and key partners. Um, and I'll say, I've always been a fan of OSLC from the initial exposure to it, perhaps with IBM um, years ago, um, philosophically. And so philosophically, I'm aligned and predisposed toward it. Um, the question is what the realization looks like and how that um, is coming about. And that's why I, I, I describe this as a little bit of an ask for the community. I wanna talk about it in terms of the evolution of model-based design, because I think I'd like to use that as the mechanism to talk about the, the extent of what we're doing. Um, so many of you maybe have some familiarity with how we approach things in model-based design. Now, I won't go through it in much detail, but certainly at the heart of it is the use of models um, to capture and characterize customs requirements, to describe architecture, both of the system and of the software, um, refinement of those models to lead to automatic code generation of C or C++ or HDL or CUDA code or whatever it happens to be, given the target uh, processors, and then object code. Okay, so that's the sort of the through pathway from an implementation standpoint. But our perspective of model-based is not only about the implementation, but it's also about the verification and validation. And so being able to leverage those same models um, to be able to discover errors during design time as opposed to at implementation, being able to do it at the unit, the subsystem and integration points using a combination of static and simulation-based approaches and, and being in many cases driven by standards like MISRA or Automotive Spice or whatever it happens to be. Um, but it also leads up front to, you know, capturing to the requirements, making sure that the requirements are valid, that they're not in conflict and, and so on. So, so you know, and, and as we all know, the whole objective is to find defects earlier and uh, bake the quality into the development process with robust design approaches and so on. So, you know, that's a little bit of what we talk about. But, but if we zoom out, from this particular view, you know, we're talking really about the life cycle and, and, and that's where this community conversation is. Um, and so if we start with sort of at our view, the heart of that, that, that is, those are the models of the system, the models of the subsystems that are decompositions and the models of the operating environment in which the system operates. And, you know, of course, MathWorks has a bunch of capability for modeling and simulating with MATLAB, with Simulink, but a key piece, and this, this gets a little bit to the puzzle, is interoperability. So we interoperate with lots of other modeling tools, programming languages, middleware, and, and other things, okay? Um, we, we want to, we have to. Our customers need that from us so that their simulate models of the system can actually be composed of many component models as well. 
so that there's a continuity from, let's say, a, C a mechanical CAE model, the reuse of that perhaps is reduced toward a model into a system model so that there's a continuity of modeling approaches. And so, you know, when we think about linking to the earlier session of artifacts and models, um, we have to have approaches that can link and track um, all these different variety of third, what we call third party things. And, and that's a puzzle because not all of them will work with um, OSLC. Now, the objective in doing that is to make simulatable models because then those models can become you know, things that are presented to the customer to make sure there's good refinement of requirements. There are lots of reasons for simulation, but that's essentially what those little red buttons represent. Now, the little green buttons represent. Now, of course, upstream, there's a, there's a need, as you all know, to capture requirements, to do tracing and so on and so forth. And, and again, we work with and have to work with many different requirements tools as chosen by our customers. And um, they run the gamut. Um, and so we have to have strategies and approaches that will deal with those kinds of linkages to requirements. That's certainly a primary use case um, when you think about OSLC. Um, but again, this community of tools continues to evolve. Um, and, 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 and again, the question is, is OSL, is, OSL, is OSLC well supported in those different systems? Is it supported in a consistent way in those systems? And as I've been following the Slack channel over the last day or so, um, that certainly is one of the issues that has come up in the discussion among the group. But again, it's one of the things we have to accomplish. Um, a key aspect of model-based design is code generation. And we do code generation for embedded systems. But we also more recently do code generation to other kinds of artifacts like Docker containers. And so being able to take the same artifacts and track them, not just to an embedded system workflow, but also to edge or cloud workflows is another aspect of what we do with model-based design now. And so question still happens, how does that get supported? When we think about verification and validation, system integration and test, Certainly our philosophy is to do that, not just the support of physical test benches and, and, and test cases and so on, as well as the results, but also doing it more virtually, having more model-based approaches so that you don't have to wait to have physical instantiations of the system, but you can do it early. And that's, a, that's certainly one of the benefits of model-based approaches is shifting a lot of that work left. Um, so that there's a continuity of how testing and VNV are, are done from completely virtual to a mix of virtual and real to real systems. And, and so um, certainly test is within scope. And, and actually a fair number of our customers are now, when they think about model-based design, looking beyond the development processes into leveraging the same models that were design artifacts and reusing them as digital twins, okay, a particular type of digital twin that represents the, a particular asset in operation where the model is tuned to represent that particular asset. And so um, then you get into the question of how does linking and tra tracking happen when you have many different assets that need to be tracked and dealt with? Is that still in scope from an OSLC standpoint? At that point, you're really talking about asset management more than design artifact management. And so when we think about model-based design, it's really this extent that we are addressing. Now, we have a, I won't get much into the technology we currently have, but we have tools for doing a lot of the linking and tracing, um, connection and so on and so forth, um, where it's, you know, there are gateway tools like requirements toolbox. Um, they connect to various modeling tools we have like System Composer, Simulink and Stateflow. Um, and they connect to the automatically generated code with hyperlinks and can also um, ensure, uh, also connect to the test cases and execution with test results. To, to look at the um, what satisfies and ensuring the satisfaction of those requirements. And, and doing that in a way that feels natural to our users. A lot of this is about usability and it's about automation um, so that um, people who aren't dealing with models but perhaps dealing just with code um, can still see the results as they want to and need to and can navigate appropriately as they must. And so, that's, that's again, when we think about it from a capability standpoint to satisfy the customer's objectives, 
and, and, and requirements on us. Um, that's a lot of where we're going. Now, in terms of the modeling environments, it's not just you know, one or two tools, and it's not just Simulink and state flow and system composer. System composer you may not be familiar as familiar with. System composer is an add-on to Simulink for the earlier parts of the MBSE process, the architecture, the allocation, and so on. It can connect to SysML tools, and but essentially that's the role that it plays in the development process. Um, and so being able to connect and trace and manage to all those different artifacts in these modeling environments is important. But it's also, of course, from our perspective, connecting to code, MATLAB code, for example. And so we have recently added support from the same requirements toolbox. Some of you may be familiar with a product called Simulink Requirements, which was a, um, a tool that supported the Simulink platform um, and, and dealt with the requirements management uh, for the Simulink family of products. We've essentially recast Simulink Requirements as a broader toolbox for requirements that supports MATLAB and Simulink workflows um, equally well. From, from our perspective. I realize I'm talking in a math work centric manner, but that that's it is what it is. So um, and so when we think about model-based design, it's not just simulating based, but it's also MATLAB based as well. Now, certainly a lot of OSLC is about integration with third-party tools. And we have a, a strong variety of those integrations, but you know, we've encountered up front um, a lot of the issues of consistency, of round tripping of management of links and so on. Um, and and um, yeah, given the extent of what I dealt with in previous slides. Um, so we support things like REC IF. I, you, you probably, probably each person in this meeting has a strong opinion about REC IF, let's not go there. Um, it is what it is. Um, we also have started to support OSLC, particularly with um, the introduction of a client API uh, last year in the requirements toolbox that can access and modify as a client. Um, data in various products where we, we provide a client capability. Um, now, I'm not an OSLC expert, so I don't know if we would properly call this a client because there are certain diagrams or views or things like that that I believe are part of the OSLC standard that we don't support. But the objective is to basically be able to consume, interrogate and consume and, and align with data that are, are being presented by OSLC, OSLC servers. Um, and, and to support the various domains described here. So the requirements management, the quality management with test, and the change management domains. And, and to support these particular actions and activities um, for resources that are being um, uh, consumed or linked to from an OSLC provider. So this is you know, relatively new for MathWorks. Um, it's a step, I think, in the right direction. But um, there was a comment, I think, on the Slack channel, which is that I think an observation both mostly by end user customers, which I think is very good and pragmatic, which is that um, independent software vendors like us um, will do things when it's in our business interests. And maybe that's obvious, maybe it's not, but our business interest is driven by our customer's interest. And so um, it makes sense to us if it is something that is being demanded by our customers. And I think that's an important part of the equation from an ISV perspective. Um, and so we will do the right things based on customer demand, based on customers driving us in certain directions. But um, I'll, I will say that the, the clamor, the request for OSLC support has not been uniform. And I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as loud either at this point. So there's work to be done on that front. Now, in addition to that, there's an aspect that our customer's perspective of their own life cycle is changing. Um, and, and you probably either, if you're, if you're in the industry or if you're supporting the industry, you probably see the same thing happening. Um, in many industries, companies are going from physical systems that have embedded functionality to software-defined systems where there's an inversion in terms of the value proposition of what's physical and what's software-based. Um, and, and so when I talk to systems engineers, I will often use a depiction like this, okay? It's kind of a normal life cycle view. 
with feedback loops. So you get insight from the system in operation and you can either use it to inform or update functionality or, um, or support the next generation design of that system. But, um, and, and, and for that purpose, we work with PLM systems. You know, we have to, we do, that's the, I'll say the heritage system of record for this type of mindset and approach. But as we deal more with organizations that are software defined, different set of challenges, faster and more rapid release cycles of software, much faster than you're gonna be updating the hardware. Um, making sure that the software test and evaluation can be done as early as possible, as complete as possible, as agile as possible. Um, enabling new types of data and functionality and pushing it to systems that are in the field which means a different type of system of record that's not bill of material based and, and a different mindset in general. And so while I may use this kind of diagram for a systems engineering um, mindset, I will use a different view for a software view, okay? Um, because it is a question of getting more agile. And yes, our products can work you know, they map onto the agile development. That's the easy part, um, you know, the different stages of where they're relevant. The harder thing, which we also do, is to make sure that they can be driven by CI systems, that they can be automated. They can be connected to, you know, some of the things I did hear and see in other presentations um, that are newer systems of record, like Jira for issues tracking, Git, and the, the Gits, and, and so on, um, and doing it on the desktop as well as in the cloud. And, and I guess I haven't caught up with OSLC to know how it can live in that kind of rapid iteration, rapid change management type of situation. So I'm interested in being caught up on that front. But it's also a matter of taking the operation view and connecting it. And so connecting to the other systems of record um, after development and making sure that um, our tooling works with being able to update based on data that's coming from the systems in the field, um, deploying in different form factors, as I mentioned, not just embedded, but also things like Docker uh, containers and, 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 and the like. So um, what we do is to take a lot of the agile methods and DevOps approaches that are well-baked from a software perspective and, and to look at how to make them relevant from a systems perspective, where it's software and systems connected together. And so that's a lot of where our customers are today. And so in summary, model-based design does encompass a very broad set of modeling and code-based technologies from, from lots of different vendors, lots of different sources, as well as handwritten code coming from customers. So it's not just MathWorks. And our customers need us to support their workflows. And so our capabilities both must follow and also anticipate those customer needs. And I, I kind of want to make that our value opportunity from a vendor perspective. Yes, there's a business motive to it, but at the end of the day, this is our North Star. And as our customers increasingly adopt software-defined system mindsets and the agile and DevOps approaches, their perspectives of lifecycle management methods and tooling and systems uh, are shifting. And so given that as the context, this is where I am. Okay, again, I was an early advocate philosophically of OSLC, but I'm interested in what's the state of the art? Where are the approaches? Where's the tooling? And how are things keeping pace? And so that's what I wanted to go over today. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much. Um, I, I think it's good to hear a, a critical tone also and a critical perspective to, to remind us what is, what is important. Um, I mean, you showed this slide with DevOps, you know, and I think we have until now often talked about what an OSLT API is, but how it gets used and deployed and configured in a way that supports, um, you know, these efficient continuous integration pipelines, um, this automation. So um, uh, there are still, I think, we're definitely, that's my perspective. Um, we haven't reached the maturity uh, in using OSLT as we see, uh, as we see in software engineering, where you know we have very sophisticated tools to perform 
continuous integration pipelines and and most of them also rely on containers and the cloud you you, you mentioned this in your slide mm -hmm. and um so we yeah the, the oslt apis right now are not necessarily deployed as containers they're, they're right now usually not ready for a cloud native environment like kubernetes um so and and then the config the configuration of these oslt apis is done a bit ad hoc you know each oslt api is, is configured a bit differently even even though ideally i think some of these aspects should be defined centrally um, in order to be done efficiently yeah. um so well i i've i've just briefly shared what is on my mind um i look at slack oh no there's a in q a there is a, a question so does matlab provide a no slt server for access to its resources aha good question <laughs> unexpected question um no we do not um we do not supply supply a server side capability at this point and i might add to that question is there any web api to MATLAB because any tools that have a web API are obviously easier to connect to? Um, a web API. Like the REST um, API? Like there, 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 there are various, I guess I'll put it this way, from a, we have various paths toward deployment, not from a development standpoint, from a deployment standpoint, and some of those artifacts that are deployed, for example, using MATLAB compiler. So think of that as a model or a program that's been packed up and then it's gonna be used by the customer in operation or as part of a, um, um, a larger enterprise compute or whatever it happens to be. Um, those, those, those produced artifacts have REST APIs or can have REST APIs associated mm -hmm. with them, but um, we do not have, um, I'll say web links to the design artifacts in cloud. We do have something called, um, and I didn't mention this, um, in addition to the, probably the desktop versions of MATLAB and Simulink that you may be familiar with, um, we also do have um, MATLAB online, Simulink online, which are um, which present themselves to the customer as browser-based instances of tools or the backend server and so on. Oh, cool. um, okay. and, and that's that's a little bit of where we're going. Um, um, and, and if you're if you have a MathWorks license, you probably already have access to the online uh, versions of the tools. Um, it's um, it's a little bit of where I guess I'll, I'll say it, it's it's a it's a hint of where we're going. Um, there is technology and latency and all sorts of fun issues associated with that because at the end of the day our customers want um, a perfect interactive experience and and when you're dragging blocks around a canvas and you know clicking them and so on and so forth you really want to make that extremely snappy and and the technology doesn't permit that today but it's getting closer and closer so um so we are we are cognizant of that and, and when you think about that kind of an approach then your question becomes more relevant um, in terms of web-based approaches and links. But um, that, that's kind of where we are today. Okay, interesting. Um, there is another question in the Q&A about linking IBM Rhapsody design artifacts to MathWorks System Composer. Um, I, the, the question is, does MathWorks have a solution for this? What we've done to date is, um, What we've done to date is to support um, from a SysML perspective, I'll be quite specific, from a SysML notation or modeling perspective, um, as you may know, SysML1 supports um, XMI. Um, and so we are able to both um, um, ingest and also generate an XMI description. And so that becomes one form of connection. Um, and for a lot of our customers using System Composer, where they are going to do, or there might be a, a model of record maybe in a SysML, then a handoff to a lot of design iterations that are done using System Composer and Simulink, um, that's often the way they work. 
and then they will then perfect their design and then and then generate a description back out, whether Rec IF or whether um, an XMI description um, to 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 connect again. So that's a workflow that's often used today. Um, I guess I'll just add that System Composer. Well, I think I said it earlier. System Composer is a an add-on to Simulink. So the System Composer architecture diagram visually is actually at its heart, a Simulink set of models. And so all the things we talk about in terms of um, being able to integrate with third-party modeling tools and the like um, can, can be also incorporated in the System Composer view from an architecture perspective. Uh, but, but at the very beginning, that's not what customers typically do. They'll describe the architecture and want to define interfaces, as you all probably know. Um, to generate views for different stakeholders and 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 and, and generate the ICDs, um, and and for that they don't need a full Simulink experience. What they need is a smaller experience where they can do you know the cocktail napkin equivalent of a drawing to be able to refine ideas, and and that's what System Composer is used for, as well as for the handoff from from other tools. And that would be I don't I don't know about I've forgotten about Rhapsody um, and what its support is for the various um, interface standards, but um, I'm happy to follow up if you're if you're interested in that. Um, one final question, which you you cannot read because it comes from a panelist, and panelists cannot submit their questions to the Q and A module. Um, the question is, what did you think were the inhibitors for OSLC around agile? I don't know, and actually, and actually, that, that's a that's a great question because. Um, I was, I was actually going to ask you all that question. <laughs> and, and, and actually, actually, you sort of started to allude to that a little bit in terms of the CI. Um, I, I guess I've been struck that when I hear requests for OSLC, it is for organizations whose processes are not particularly agile. <laughs> are, are not agile. And, and I think I've probably, you know, Done the mental, I've, I've sort of drawn the conclusion that um, either from a technical standpoint or a mindset standpoint or a something standpoint, that um, it is not being used there, and and so I don't know what the issue is. I'm just sort of posing the the puzzle for you all because you probably know that, and you know again our goal is to help customers get there. If you say, in fact, there are no problems, here's how to do it, bump, 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 bump. I'm happy to learn that. If you say, in fact, it could be done in some cases, but it requires a certain approach, you know, in order to stay on the paved road, that would also be useful. Because right now, um, again, I still I still remain a, uh, favorably disposed to OSLC. But at the end of the day, um, I, my, my allegiance is to the customers. So anything you can provide me along those lines would actually be helpful. Uh, great. Do you want to possibly uh, say something and unmute, us, unmute yourself? Yes. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hi, Jim. It's Gray Bachelor. No, really, really interesting question. And I think that uh, what's driving a lot of customers is not so much the style or their aspiration. Of course, I think everybody wants to be agile, don't they? I think that it's the complexity angle. And at least from the IBM side, pretty much every customer is using what we've affectionately known as the jazz platform for the last 10 or more years. Yep. Has has you know been using OSLC, even if they weren't necessarily aware that that was the, <laughs> the benefit they were taking. Yep. Um, and those stem from people doing, you know, what, what we would say is pure scrum mm -hmm. all the way through to safe and beyond, you know, and you can run, you know, more formal workflows. So at least, and I, others may comment, but at least from the IBM side, you know, agile um, OSLC was born from jazz, which was born from agile, but, you know, it's a great way of keeping coherence under complex change. And, you know, so yeah, let's talk more, but I think just some, Thoughts there about the origin and, and where we are today. I think they're really good. Uh, you know, it's a good remark as to how do we make it more attractive. If, if yeah. it's a bit yeah, and I, 
Yeah, and I'd had conversations with Iran and others, you know, back in the early days with with jazz, and so I sort of remember that heritage. Um, but um, the current state is the thing that puzzles me, right? Um, and so, and so, if, if it's a question of hearkening back to the, the the original reasons for its origins, maybe that's one aspect. But you know, at the end of the day, I need to talk to customers who have a current state, current set of skills, current set of knowledge, certain set of workflows supported by tools, and and help them. So anyway, I, I, I went back to this because, you know, there's my email address. So I'm happy to catch up with any all. I realize that's a, I'm asking for, for whatever, um, but I'm happy to connect uh, for people who are interested in what I've been posing. Uh, and was... I, I, I unfortunately cannot stay on much longer. I got, a, I got another call right now, another meeting, but um, again, happy.